Transmission is live because we are live with the community. This is the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Development Bi-Weekly Call. Today is October 26th. This is our last Thursday community call in October of 2023 together, everybody. Woo! So excited. We have a fantastic agenda in store for us all today. We're going to see a number of updates on the community across a number of initiatives, .NET libraries, PowerShell, Yo! Teams, Microsoft Teams Toolkit, Microsoft Graph Toolkit, uh, script samples, team samples, power platform samples, all the samples, they're all here. We got them ready for you. And then, of course, everybody's favorite time, picture time with together mode. So get those hair done. Uh, I already got mine done. It took like no time at all. But after that, we are going to have three fantastic presenters of the day, our all stars. Jeffrey is going to cover crowdsourced cataloging, rebranding via Power Apps and AI models. So we've got a better together story there. Awesome. Dennis is going to cover using SharePoint as an enterprise data source for a private GPT chatbot. And then Matt's going to round it out with creating a single custom connector for multiple Azure open AI models. So we got all the AI here, everybody. Stay tuned. But first, we have resources for you. Now, these are not just any resources. This is a plethora of resources because it means a lot to us. We've got videos. So you can subscribe today. You can get access to all the videos from the community and Microsoft. We've got a LinkedIn group for discussions. We've got open source initiatives, things like PNPJS, CLI for Microsoft 365, a number of resources there for you. And then I had mentioned those sample galleries. There are so many of them, it's mind boggling. You can get access to team samples, SPFX samples, Power Platform samples, list formatting samples. It just goes on and on and on. And you don't got to remember all those URLs. Nope, nope. Just one, aka.ms slash community slash home will give you access to all these resources, which are 100% free. So take advantage of them today. Now, you're on this call because you'd love community calls. We love them too. And we got plenty of them for you. The Microsoft 365 and Power Platform weekly call with Microsoft speakers is on Tuesdays. We're going to talk about what the agenda is for that coming up, but you definitely want to get that on your calendar because it is coming directly from the mothership. Program managers, product managers, sharing the cool new features and functionality of the products that we love. We've got our Power Platform monthly call, which happens on the third Wednesday of every month. And we've got some fun news coming up for that. Office add-ins, and then, of course, our sibling calls, Microsoft 365 and Power Platform community, which you are on right now, and our Viva Connections and SharePoint Framework, which will be a week from now. You can get access to all these calls at aka.ms slash community slash calls. Download those invites. Get them on your calendar. You do not want to miss them. These are like a crystal ball to the what's now, what's new, and what's next that the entire world is doing with the technology that we love. So take advantage of it. Don't miss it. That Microsoft only speakers call we've got coming up on the 31st of October next Tuesday. Dan Walleen's going to be back on the series he's running, and it's going to be on sending email and SMS me uh, me messages with Azure Communication Services. And then Robert Perillo is going to be here. He's one of our Power Platform hack winners on the best, better together solution. So we look forward to both those, and we might have one more that sneaks in there, so stay tuned for that. And you may be thinking, well, I want to present on these calls. I got something cool to share. We absolutely welcome you to do that. Please don't overthink it. Please do not think at all that you have to create a flux capacitor and make time travel possible or cold fusion or something like that. We welcome calls and demos that show how to show functionality, basic techniques, tips and tricks, things that you love and that you've benefited by. A solution where you've learned something. Don't hesitate to share with us what you want to show off to the community. There is value for everyone. We are always having new ones into the technology and the landscape, and they need that situational awareness. So uh, reach out if you have any questions, because we absolutely can make sure that we buddy you up with someone as well. So uh, if you feel like uh, I've never really presented before, it's a little intimidating. No problem. We'll buddy you up with someone, and we will make sure that you present together, you craft it together, and it's going to be a fantastic experience. Now. You may also be thinking, I have been seeing a lot of cool badges lately, and I want to submit or I want to contribute to the community. Well, our Sharing is Caring program is one that provides that kind of guidance. Uh, these are hands-on sessions. We're going to have more coming up, especially with the holidays and Microsoft slowing down. We have more time to do that. We're scaling up with more volunteers, and we've started creating some more videos. And so we're going to get those released. Uh, stay tuned for more schedules. But these are free, live, hands-on sessions that are safe space. They're not recorded, so you can feel free to ask any and all questions. Questions, and we're finally setting up those office hours. So you can just drop in with a question if you're working with a GitHub 
uh, poll request and you just have a quick question before you want to hit submit to feel confident, we'll be there to provide you that confidence. So check it out, ak.ms slash sharing is caring. And of course, we want to recognize you for the work you're doing. So our community recognition program, all those cool badges powered by Credly is live and well. We've been seeing them all over the interwebs lately. We've got our Hacktoberfest. You've got a few days left, folks, to get that Hacktoberfest badge. It is gone after October. Once November gets here, bye-bye Hacktoberfest. So if you submit and uh, a pull request now in October, you will absolutely get this one month only badge. But Coming in right on its heels is the season of getting. So these are limited edition badges that you can get. They're fun, and they show that you're making a difference in the community. It is absolutely free of charge. All you got to do is opt in at ak.ms slash community slash recognition. We cover the cost of all the credly uh, payments, and we will make sure that you're taken care of. Have any questions? Reach out. Let us know. There's a bunch of badges that have been going out and are continuing to go out. Thank you, Vesa. All right, now it's time for some project-specific updates, so let's kick it off with Bert. Awesome. Thank you, David. So in the pnp.net world, uh, in our libraries, uh, we had a couple of changes uh, this week, the last two weeks, actually. Uh, so for PNP framework, which is the older uh, legacy, I would not, let's not call it legacy, the older library. Uh, Jack did a fix on uh, setting default settings. Um, uh, Miguel Angel Garcia Martinez, long name. Did some improvements around kind of escaping the correct names when creating groups. So it was like an alias, like a, a, a quote, which was not really properly escaped. So he fixed that. And Anti worked on uh, adding uh, term labels in, for multiple languages. So that wasn't fully implemented. So he fixed that. So thanks for that, everyone. On the Corsica case side, a um, couple of things as well. Um, <clears throat> so our admin library, which you can use to enumerate site collections, uh, for example, uh, that will now does support the new multi-geo endpoints. So when you enumerate sites and your tenant is multi-geo, you get all the site collections regardless of where they are, which is really good. Uh, then uh, there was some really weird paging issue in the list, load list data stream. Essentially, if there was more than 5,000 items and the, the item count was uh, like um, um, the, the page size was a multiple of the item count, and you got kind of a weird issue, which was fixed. And finally, uh, Mr. FF Frox 92 did some uh, doc updates for the WebAssembly symbol. With that, let's move to Gautam for PowerShell. Thank you all. See you next time. Awesome. Thank you, bro. I think we call it vintage, right? No, legacy sounds old, but vintage sounds classic. <laughs> or classic. Hey, got him. Take it away with PowerShell. Thanks, David. Yep. Yep, uh, PNP PowerShell updates, yay. So PNP PowerShell is a PowerShell uh, library that you can use to connect to various Microsoft 365 services like SharePoint, Teams, Azure AD, uh, oops, sorry, Entra ID, uh, and lots more services as well. So what what new in the latest nightly builds? Uh, we improved the PNP field commandlet, so it now returns a, a lot more uh, dedicated information related to that uh, type field. Uh, we also improved the get PNP content type and the get PNP site collection admin command list. So now it also returns more properties when you use the includes parameter. So we basically added this includes parameter support for these two commands. Uh, another command that we added was this uh, get PNP site version policy. So you can fetch the site version policy settings using this particular commands. Uh, we also made uh, contrib uh, contributing to PNP partial a lot more easier with the addition of a new dev container. So do check it out. I uh, would absolutely love to hear your feedback on that. And besides that as well, uh, we'd absolutely love to hear you. Uh, this is the season of uh, getting as well as Hacktoberfest is going on. Five more days to go. So uh, just uh, help us out on the issue list as well as reach us out on GitHub as well. Would absolutely love to hear from you. Thanks, David. Awesome. Thank you, Gautam. I'll cover Yo Teams. We've got a new preview release, uh, Generator Teams at 4.11111-preview.3. <laughs> Check out that uh, preview release. Supports for Manifest 1.16. Fix some stuff in there, so definitely check it out. There are lots of opportunities to lean in and help out here. Bug fixes, uh, improvement on features, so go check it out at ak.ms slash Yo Teams. And let's move on to Teams Toolkit with John. Thanks, David. We're still working on the 5.3 pre-release uh, for VS Code, so that's available in the marketplace. If you want to check that out, some new templates, samples. Um, you can create uh, the new simplified message extensions, et cetera, in the preview. Uh, for VS and .NET developers, we also have brought some more of our templates to that experience. And 
Uh, well, we will support .NET 8 and 17.9. I know that I think that question came up last time. So 17.9, we will have .NET 8 support. Uh, we're basically going to skip 7. Uh, and then we're still working on plugins and all the fun new stuff coming to the platform. Uh, and that'll be hopefully for the next release. So let me know if you have any questions or if you want to chat about your experience. There's a link there. You can uh, schedule some time directly with me. Appreciate it. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, John. And if you're wanting to get involved with Graph and find the easiest way to do it, we've got it for you. Sebastian. So what's new with um, one uh, with the Graph Toolkit? We just released our 313 um, uh, version, but we are currently pondering if we're going to um, uh, ship a version four of the Graph Toolkit. So um, we had some really interesting movement in uh, two different areas, um, one around migrating our um, uh, foundation framework we're using, which is Lit, which is our web component framework, to version three, which would give probably 50 to 60% performance improvements on the toolkit. So uh, come to our repo, let us know if we should do it. Uh, the second reason is to support tree shaking. So right now the library does not support tree shaking. If you um, bring one component, you bring all the components, we have a PR up for supporting that, but that might be a breaking change to you. So we're looking at potentially bumping the version to four so we can uh, put it in a nice way. So we'd love to learn um, about the way you're using it and if you think we should do it. So come to our repo, aka.ms slash MGT, and let us know. Back to you, David. Awesome. Thanks, Seb. Let's get into script samples with Paul Bullock. Yes, yeah, so script samples is a repository where you can share your PowerShell and Bash scripts with uh, the community. And we, we celebrated a bit of a milestone recently. So I've just crossed the 600th PR. Um, so I've processed that, that which is uh, amazing. So thank you very much to all those that have committed samples throughout its lifetime. It's a, a, a big achievement. So thank you. And we have quite a bumper pack of new samples as well. So we've got um, a new update user photo by Peter. And we've got a get membership report of sites with tenant by Reshmi. Uh, export teams uh, direct routing calls by Nandeep. Uh, export teams PSTN call logs by Nandeep. Uh, we've got uh, get disabled or inactive user accounts by Casper. And we've got some new scenarios, some updates, sorry, uh, uh, with the CLI. Uh, so those samples previously mentioned, so export to team threat routing calls by Smita submitted an update, uh, create site columns and add content types for Ganesh. Uh, we've also got exports from Microsoft Teams, PSTN calls by Smita again. Um, we've also got creation of SharePoint online sites by CSV from Ganesh, so a bumper pack so far. And uh, we've got a couple more, so archive team sites by Henrik, and then we've got uh, export lists and libraries, item count permissions to CSV by Alex, which is super, super cool to have so many samples. So that's that's amazing. So thank you very much for all those contributions. Again, if you need any help with contributing, feel free to reach out to myself. There is contribution guidance on the site to get you started and a, and a, a script as well, a, a new sample script uh, to help you get started. And thank you to those that have uh, identified some issues with that script, which has been fixed recently. So awesome stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, but back to you, David. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Lots of great stuff there, everybody. Great, easy way to get involved. Reach out to Paul. He's very, very helpful. OK, let's move over to Microsoft Team Samples with Bob German. Bob, you're muted. I know. How did that happen? Um, yeah, I need an app that takes me off mute at the right moment. Um, <laughs> hey, another really great sample today from our the inimitable Marcus Moeller. Say that three times fast. And this is really kind of two in one. So it's cool to have a meeting app. And this is a meeting app that does some, you know, some simple but important things like call the graph with SSO. But what's cool about it is that he's got a second app there that actually creates the meeting and installs the app. So if you want to kind of automate that, have a series of meetings or something, and every time your app is auto-installed, check out this new sample. The URL is right here. And thanks again to Marcus for another great sample. Back to you, David. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. And Marcus, well done again. Now, last but not least, Power Platform prompts. We're going to talk a little bit about it with April. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Just want to remind you about our Power Platform Prompt Library. This is a great place to get started if you want to contribute to the community. If you've been using any of the AI tools, 
or the co-pilots inside of the Power Platform, and you want to share those with the rest of the community so they can get some ideas of what they can use and have a tested prompt that they know will work in the tools. So this is everything from Power Apps Copilot with the to build an app, to edit an app, Power Automate Copilot, Power Virtual Agents Copilot, even things like AI Builder. So putting in prompts to do things within the AI Builder tool for the Create Text with ChatGPT and all the possibilities that that offers. We're just off the heels of our Power Platform AI Hackathon. So I'm sure everyone that participated has a bunch of prompts that you use as a part of that. We'd love to see them here in this repository. And also, if you're wanting to show off your prompts or what you've been doing with Copilot, we actually have a session dedicated to that in our next community call, our November community call. It's going to be all Copilot. So make sure to check that out and learn more about what you can do with AI and Copilots in the Power Platform. Back to you, David. Roger, roger. <laughs> see co-pilot anyways all right everybody let's get to the optional picture time let's get those cameras turned on see those fantastic faces Woo! Vesta is set and he is taking over there we go i will take over i will not put the camera on because we are almost pixel perfect almost almost a uh, few more seconds uh, let's wait uh, 50 seats in a room a lot of familiar faces again nick is in the middle dan is on the middle here we go sip sip you are here now you can do show how it can can be done yeah there we go there we go let's follow up with Sep's ah, he's example. kicking us uh, off yep. the, yeah there we go there we go i will put the recording on we'll crap ak funimation out of that for five seconds and try to stay in the in the rhythm <laughs> Excellent. This is looking great. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Brilliant work. Excellent. We'll crap a GIF animation out on that. Good work, everybody. Awesome to see familiar faces and smiling faces. Right, David? Absolutely. You got it. Those fantastic smiles. Miraculous mugs. I can come up with more, but it'll just be horrible. So let's move on to our amazing presenters of the day. We're going to kick it off with Jeffrey. <laughs> Thank you, Vesa. We're going to kick it off with Jeffrey on crowdsource catalog and rebranding via Power Apps and AI models. And everybody, this is Jeffrey's first presentation on the on the uh, community call. So let's give him a warm welcome. Jeffrey, feel free to take it on over when you're ready. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what a whirlwind. You guys get a lot of information across very quickly. A lot of new words that I'm learning. I'm really happy to be here with everyone. Um, I am here to present a fun use case for the Power Platform, uh, AI Builder, uh, Object Detection and Text Recognition. Uh, before I begin, I have kind of a, I guess in this sense, a unique background where I have no technical experience. In fact, just like a year and a half ago, I was washing cars for my company's fleet. Um, and what I noticed is there was a lot of opportunity to modernize our, our practices. We were taking a lot of notes on paper. We were keeping records on, on notepads. And then one guy was tasked with uploading that information to an Excel workbook. And there was just tons of opportunity, a lot of milk on the floor, so to speak. Um, and I got linked into the Power Platform from someone from our chief data office. Um, and all I kind of needed was an introduction and a bit of assistance getting started. And uh, this platform just kind of unraveled itself to me as I, as I moved along through it. And I was able to quickly solve problems all around me uh, using templates. And then from those templates, I was able to take them apart and rebuild them and uh, upskill and learn how to create new solutions from scratch. And then any question I had, I was able to just hop on YouTube and watch an April Dunham video or listen to Reza and kind of figure out who solved this, how can I modify their solution, and how can I uh, impact my, my workday? So uh, you don't have to be an expert. If this is your first time in this meeting like my, uh, do not be alarmed because we can do this and there is a community that's welcoming and full of information that can help us along. So without further ado, here's the fleet wrap detector. So I work for at and I work for at ts fleet, and in this fleet, uh, we have a huge number of vehicles. We have over 60,000 vehicles deployed in the field. And of that number, somehow we lost count of the advertisements that are on the sides of these vehicles, which is a huge problem, as you can imagine, because we've got vehicles out there that are uh, advertising products we no longer support or products we no longer support in specific regions. We've got UVerse projects, uh, wraps or uh, DirecTV wraps a mystery machine wrap somewhere out there. And we just had a hard time gathering information accurately and efficiently. So um, 
I just started a new job within Fleet. Uh, no more washing cars. Now I'm a data analyst of some sort. And uh, I was still asked, hey, can you get a, a, an understanding of what's out there? And I said, sure. Well, I think the easiest way for me to gather information would be just a Microsoft form. And my leadership team said, yeah, that would work, but we'd like you to spend a little more time in the ideation phase, which is a wonderful prompt and a sign of uh, great things to come, I think. So I was like, okay, because I watch April's channel, because I'm locked in with the community on YouTube, I know that we could use object detection. I can build an AI model that will detect a wrap. And then we can send that information to uh, the data warehouse of our choice with a power automation flow. So there was an opportunity here. I could uh, display my uh, power platform skill set by updating wrap records from just a photo. That photo would detect a wrap in the field, uh, detect text, and then migrate that data uh, to a SharePoint library or a SQL database. And that got my leadership team's brain spinning. And I think that's one of the best parts about this platform is an idea can go into um, development very quickly and then from development into production just as fast. So. What are the features necessary in the solution? Uh, I don't know if anyone works in the telco industry or the construction industry or anything like that, but it's pretty difficult to kind of uh, push a new initiative out into the field, especially when you have as many technicians as we have. Everyone is, is mired by efficiency numbers and metrics. So we don't want to impede anyone's workflow. This solution has to be as simple as possible. One button click or two button clicks, maybe four at most. Um, and then it also needs to be connected to live data. We, luckily, we have tons of data tables in our SQL database that are connected to like live vehicle inventories, but we need our application to refresh as often as those uh, inventories do. And then I want it to feel scalable. I want uh, my peers and my leaders to be able to present ideas and then see those ideas go into a development environment very quickly. Uh, it should feel modular like synthesizers or, or, or Legos or connects or something like that. Uh, and the Power Platform allows us to do that. So how it works is we build, I build a really simple Power App, which is just the souped up form, just to get this uh, into the hands of our technicians. Within this Power App, I've embedded a Power Automation Flow. Within that Power Automation Flow, I embedded an AI Builder model. That automation flow sends information to a SharePoint uh, document library for storage. And then I've got a very simple Power BI dashboard to display that information uh, to report to my peers or leadership. So uh, as I mentioned, I do not have a technical background. Uh, as I said, there were a lot of cool terms used just in the last 15 minutes. Tree shaking was new to me, so I hopped on a Bing chat while you all were talking. I was like, oh, I learned a bit more today. Uh, but I use LLMs maybe 60 times a day at this point as I'm learning. Uh, I use it for everything from drafting emails. Uh, when I get technical emails sent to me from other departments that I can't really make sense of, I ask for an explanation of this email. And then I will type in my thoughts or my response and I'll say, hey, make me sound smarter reference the previous email and use some of the same terms and send that email back to the person. Um, I use LLMs for uh, Power Apps formulas, for DAX functions. Uh, I use it as a code comment generator or function or formula comment generator. Uh, I like to use it in Power Automate. Each line I'll add notes. Uh, I'll just uh, take the the uh, peak code from a, a step in a power automation flow, drop it into a large language model and say, hey, summarize this in two sentences. Then I'll copy that and drop it into each step of the power automation flow. Uh, but basically, in the last seven months, I've become bionic, or at least I feel that way. Um, I'm also getting into Python scripts now, and I see there's opportunity for me to implement those Python scripts I write with large language models into power automate desktop flows. So. The sky is the limit, or at least it feels that way. So I'm certainly empowered. And I hope if you haven't experienced these large language models, or if you haven't implemented them in your workflow, I really encourage you to do so. So back to the problem at hand. So we at t has about eight wraps that are deployed in the field, um, and they are as follows. Uh, in order for me to develop an AI model that can detect these wraps on a vehicle via photo, I need to collect images of each wrap. Now, uh, the AI model uh, 
requires at least 15 images. I found that you know at least 50 is a, is a better place to land. So I need 50 images of each vehicle's wrap, and I want it from multiple angles. And unfortunately, uh, here in Dallas, I don't have access to each one of these wraps. So that created a, a problem, uh, but also with every problem is an opportunity. So I, was, I thought maybe I can crowdsource this image collection. So in order to crowdsource image collection, to gather about 50 photos of each wrap, I was able to create a fleet collection application in Power Apps. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this process needs to be as simple as possible. So this app has about five steps. You enter a vehicle number or take a photo of the vehicle number. You capture a photo of the vehicle, tag the, the photo you've taken, verify the results, and then upload it to SharePoint. Here's what it looks like. That process begins with collecting a vehicle number. Uh, I built a very simple power app, uh, really just one button, and I tried to make it mimic the iOS uh, photo application. And I, I created a, a little guideline that shows, hey, kind of keep these images the same size and keep the context similar. So you'll take a photo of the vehicle number. Each vehicle has a unique ID. That vehicle number gets stored in a, a collection locally. And then you're asked to take 10 photos of your vehicle, five photos of the passenger side, five photos of the driver's side. And each photo has a different angle guide, right? Uh, and after you take one photo, you progress to the next screen and the angle shifts. So we should get a standardized set of photos in our SharePoint library for each vehicle's wrap. Uh, to collect or to create this angle guide, all I did was take a photo from my cell phone and then like uh, trace it in Microsoft Paint, right? And then I used that photo and just uh, embedded it in my Power App. So after you've taken 10 photos, you're asked to simply press a button and each button uh, creates a different variable value for a wrap variable within the application and that gets stored in the collection. Once you've collected the vehicle number, the vehicle photos, and you've identified the wrap, you're asked to verify that information on a very simple verification screen. If that information is incorrect, or if you've taken bad photos, or if you've taken 10 photos of yourself on, by mistake, simply hit retry and the process starts over. But if those results look good, you press submit. Of course, when building an application specifically for field deployment, we want every button to have a reaction or an action to make this app feel responsive. So you press submit and in the cloud, a power automation flow is triggered. We collect all that information and we tie it to vehicle records from a SQL database. That information then gets dropped into SharePoint. But that power automation flow in the cloud only takes about two seconds. So once that cloud automation is completed, there's a step that says respond to Power Apps. That respond to Power Apps triggers the screen to go from migrating to SharePoint to data successfully submitted. Thank you. Once there, the user can either close the app or press next vehicle if they're doing more than one. So that cloud automation flow, it's pretty simple. Uh, we're collecting variables and then just uh, creating files in SharePoint. Um, our SharePoint folder, uh, it's a document library. Each file is just an image, right? But each image has a ton of metadata that we've just migrated from our SQL database based on the inputs from the user. So the vehicle number is just used as a key value, and we just perform a query or look up in our SQL database and collect all the information we need from that database and drop it into SharePoint. It's very simple. So now that we've collected photos from the field, we have enough photos to develop an AI model. And you know, the thought of creating an AI model for a novice like me seems daunting, but I was happy to realize that I've, I'm kind of a pro at AI model creation because I've been doing it for my entire digital life. If you've uh, you know, maintained a social media presence, you've created AI models before. So it's simply uploading photos and then tagging the photos with the correct subject. So now that I've created an image collection application, an AI model, I need to now create the wrap detector application. 
Now the user can just take a photo of their vehicle's number, take a photo of their vehicle, one photo, and that information will get sent to us. I don't have to recre recreate a new application. I can just use what I've already made. I've got components. And now that I've got about a year of building apps under my belt, I've got a component library. I'm just grabbing things I've already made and dropping them into new solutions, changing some colors, maybe changing some font styles, but I'm really efficient. And you'll find that the more apps you build, the faster you are. So now I need to build a wrap detector application. And this application is gonna be even easier, just three steps. Take a photo of the vehicle number, take a photo of the vehicle, and then upload. That process is quite familiar. In this situation, we're only taking one photo. Ten are not needed. This one photo is stored locally in a collection, and it'll be used later in our object detection. Same process after you take the photo, migrating to SharePoint, data submitted. Our Automation Flow AI Builder SharePoint but well, here's the information. Now that we've got all that data into our SharePoint library, I can easily migrate it to a Power BI dashboard. So uh, within you know, a couple hours, I had quite a few responses. And in this example, I've got 10 responses. And I can immediately share this with my leadership team and say, hey, we're getting feedback. And at a glance, we can see where these wraps are located, who's driving it, what the report structure is like, and if we see how many vehicles are left to be reported on. So that's really it, Fleet Image Detector and the Fleet Wrap Detector. It's data collection simplified. Um, when I was able to turn this around to my leadership team in about a week, they were really impressed. And that was pretty exciting and um, encouraging, right? They saw what was possible. Now their minds start to, to spin and they go, wow, I see opportunities here for just general image collection. What about fender bender or insurance reporting for our vehicles or inspection reports? Our mechanics can start to use a tool like this. The use cases are, are vast. And the beauty of this power platform is everyone can, it feels approachable, right? So everyone can see that an idea can go from ideation to fruition rapidly and we can change it on the fly. It's a dynamic situation and environment. And that kind of empowers most users and everyone who's got an idea or anyone who's felt stifled in the past thinking that they need to communicate their idea to a, a development team or, or use a, a product manager or a project manager to get an idea across. We kind of streamline that process now. And a quick example is, so I was able to present this about a month ago. Um, and since then, I've already, see, uh, started working on other projects that are spin-offs of this one. Uh, the first one was actionable messages. So yeah, we can build an application and that's fun, but maybe we can just build an embedded form in an email. Uh, I saw on a, on a YouTube channel that uh, there's something called actionable messages, which are basically just JSON forms you can embed in an email and that you can respond to within the email. And that created a really cool solution. I was able to present that to my leadership team and they were like, yeah, go test that out. Uh, so on Tuesday, I submitted two, 205 actionable messages to drivers in a different organization. And in about three days, I've gotten a 62% response rate, which for a company this size, that's pretty impressive. Uh, and I got really great feedback. One of the uh, uh, construction technicians said, I've never taken an easier survey before. And that's something I was able to spin up in a, like less than a day and then send out into the field in less than in 48 hours. And I could drop that information into the same templates for Power BI dashboards and the same templates for SharePoint libraries. I'm able to churn out solutions in record time. Another cool idea is, yeah, apps are cool, surveys are cool, but hold on. What if we use an app that these users are already familiar with, like the iOS Messenger? Is it possible to use an email to trigger <coughs> an MMS and have that MMS trigger a Power Automation Flow? And the answer is yes. So just in the last two days, I've been messing around with this and I'm pretty enthused about what's possible. The Power app is cool, but what if we just send a text message to each technician and say, hey, send me a picture of your vehicle number and send me a picture of your vehicle. And then that's it. So the future is bright. Uh, and I hope that my use case and my experience or lack thereof is enough to uh, introduce uh, a few people or inspire a few others 
to get their feet wet, dabble in this platform and try to build an app. I think you'll find that it's responsive. You're more familiar with it than you might think. If you've built a PowerPoint pre presentation or worked with Excel, it's going to feel familiar. You definitely can do it. And if you stumble, there are enough resources out there available and the community is open and engaging. You'll find your footing very quickly. So that's my presentation, Data Collection Simplified. Thanks for being here, everyone. Jeffrey, 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 this is fantastic. I, you know, you mentioned that uh, you don't have a technical background, but I think you've got a bright technical future. So excellent, excellent job. I really appreciate it. Well put together, well spoken. Thank you so, so much. Uh, in the interest of time, though, we are going to go ahead and just move on directly. We're going to hand the floor over uh, to Dennis on using SharePoint as an enterprise data source for a private GPT chatbot. Dennis, you want to take on over the screen? Uh -huh. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, I'm really impressed with the uh, Jeffrey's ideas and implementations. But uh, today I'm going to show you how to configure Azure Cognitive Search to index documents stored in, stored in SharePoint. And then at the end, I'll show you how to chat with a um, corporate chat GPT like bot. Um, my name is Denis Malatsov. Uh, my expertise is everything SharePoint, Microsoft 365. And in the last several years, I've been closely working with uh, um, the Power Platform. Um, we'll work with a fictitious uh, company called uh, Tailspin. Imagine you have a SharePoint uh, site with a bunch of uh, corporate uh, procedures, uh, policies, and you've seen lots of demos with uh, ChatGPT, and you've been wondering how do you chat with it and ask questions about your fictitious tailspin corporation. Because uh, if you use the uh, like public ChatGPT, it doesn't know almost anything about your company unless it's uh, well uh, publicized and available on the in internet. There are some alternative solutions, but today we're going to use cognitive search. Don't confuse it with cognitive services, and we'll use Azure Open AI to create a bot and a website. So this is how your corporate chatbot site will look like by default although you will be able to modify it if you want. You can change the branding, logo, and really you, you have the source code. It's um, publicly available, not built by me, of course, but it's on GitHub. Uh, to start, uh, let's assume you have a bunch of policies, procedures, maybe some human resource documentation like onboarding, related documents, trivia about the company, maybe um, benefits, um, and maybe um, policies on like behavior and um, like where the closest, uh, you know, fire escape route is and so on. So suppose you get this collection. Uh, in this case, it's about give or take uh, 60, 70 documents. It might work with more, but it's a good number. I, the biggest actually problem of this part of this um, proof of concept was actually getting the documents prepared. So these documents contain um, data that I manually crafted to be relevant to that fictitious tail spin company to have a relevant chat. Uh, now that you have your data source, you need to somehow crawl it or index it. To index it, the first step would be to provision a so-called Azure Cognitive Search Service. I'm not going to do it right now, I already have it created, but, but when you choose to do it, make sure to select a standard uh, tier. It costs approximately 200 US dollars per month and you're charged per hour. So be careful with for how long you launch it or run it, but you can try it for a few hours and then 
deleted so that you're not charged. You might say it's not very convenient, but trust me, recreating it, it's very quick and I'll show you. Uh, once you have that service provisioned, this is the name I used, Clever Cognitive Search, but you can use your own. Once you have it provisioned, you need to create three components. The first and the most important one is a data source component. Um, SharePoint as a data source is still in preview, and you can only create it by sending an API request. I'm using Postman to send these requests, and I'll show you in a second how to do it. Uh, you cannot create this uh, using a uh, user interface. So, uh, another component is an indexer. An indexer, uh, you can think of it as a uh, indexer, like indexing or crawler, crawling job. Uh, something that actively goes over your SharePoint documents and saves it to your index. Index is where your um, index data is stored. Right? So um, to do it, I already have uh, these components created, but chances are you don't. Um, to have a quick start, you can find my gist on GitHub called Cognitive Search API SharePoint Data Source. In there, you have a quick manual on how to import it and which variables you need to uh, per set up. You also have two articles that you probably want to read first and, a, and an hour long tutorial if you are serious about implementing it. Once you um, once you install uh, Postman and import your collection, you'll have to go to variables section here and set up these variables. Each variable is explained in my gist, but uh, if Fairly quickly, I'll just go over them. So these two are related to cognitive search. These are related to the app registration. This app registration needs read-only access to your SharePoint documents. Uh, this is an Azure tenant. This is the same, same tenant where your SharePoint and cognitive search is. Uh, these are SharePoint site. SharePoint library URL and custom columns. If your SharePoint library has custom columns, and I recommend you have them to have them, then you can also crawl them. And to crawl them, you need to specify them here. Then through the magic of uh, Postman, these variables will be used in sending three requests. The first request uh, is going to provision a SharePoint data source. I'm going to do it as a demo just to show you it works. Maybe not here. This is a demo, but here. Let's say I'm just going to provision a different name. You don't have to change it, but for the sake of a demo, I'm creating a SharePoint data, data source called demo, sending a request. Uh, because data sources, oh, okay. <laughs> Let's create a new one like this. And literally in a second, you already have your data source here. So this is the one I just provisioned for you. And just like that, I can run two more queries to create an index. In this index, uh, you need to pay attention. The first bunch of fields are default, you don't have to change them. But the second portion is your custom fields. These are custom to you. You could set up whatever you prefer. If you have additional columns, add them here. Or if you don't use these, like annual costs and document owners, just delete them. And, and the last one is 
indexer. An indexer is something that crawls your SharePoint uh, documents and puts them in an index database. Don't need to change anything here. Just run it and you'll end up with an indexer like this. You can see how many documents it crawled. It's interesting why it's only 43, but uh, never mind that. And uh, once you have these three steps done, by the way, I could probably run them within less than a minute. This is why I'm suggesting for uh, a proof of concept deleting uh, the entire service when it's not used. You can get it up and running literally within a minute. Right. So once you have your cognitive search ready and it already crawled your uh, document libraries, which shouldn't take too long. I think it might take a, a minute or two, depending on how big your library is. So once you have that, you also need Azure OpenAI uh, service. If you don't have it yet, uh, you need to request it from Microsoft. You might get approved within 10 days. So maybe while you're watching it and you're thinking, why don't I get it? Get it now. You might get it uh, not today, but within a week or so. Um, it's not it's free while it's not used, but once you deploy it and deploy models, in this case, I'm using the latest GPT 3.5 Turbo model. Once you have that, you can uh, um, you can now deploy a website. So let's go to a website. First, let's go to a so-called playground. On the playground, you can pick your model. You deploy here, GPT 3.5 Turbo. You can set a system message prompt. I'm, I advise you to update it so that the AI knows, the model knows who it, uh, what it needs to represent. For example, I'm suggesting uh, this. You are an AI assistant who works for Tailspin and answer, answers Tailspin employees' questions uh, in a well-formatted way with line breaks. The reason I added this because I had issues with AI opening, uh, replying with no line breaks. That was kind of strange, so I just had to put this prompt. I can ask uh, some basic questions like help me with onboarding, and you'll see that it'll... Um, OK, um, it, I actually did not expect it to answer right away because the first step would be to connect to your corporate data. So right here, you can add a data source. And this is where the magic glue is. You have to select your Azure Cognitive Search. And then your AI will be context aware and it'll know which um, documents to crawl. So since I already done that, I can then deploy it using this button to a web application. When you select this button, you have to select a uh, an Azure subscription, an Azure resource group, and then wait for approximately up to 20 minutes for it to be provisioned. Yes, it takes time. And after that, you can finally chat with your bot that is uh, context aware. For example, I can ask questions like these. Where can I eat? Hopefully it'll answer that, fingers crossed. Okay, interesting. So it knows what is close to, to me. Uh, it also says I can do something for free. Uh, what is our public website? Oh, it answered quite quickly. I'm not going to go over all of these questions, but it, as you can see, it's context aware uh, thanks to the cognitive search connection to SharePoint. I can also go to chat history, go back, delete it, um, and so on. Start a new chat if I want to. OK, so that concludes my quick presentation. And uh, over to you, David. Dennis, very, very cool. Thank you. This is such an important uh, concept and uh, 
feature for us to be able to grasp to utilize the best of open AI and all the AI uh, functionality that's available to us out there. So thank you for sharing that with the community. Okay. Last but not least, Mr. Matt Jimison is going to cover creating a single custom connector for multiple Azure OpenAI models. Matt, take it away. And for all those uh, we're running just a couple of minutes behind, we absolutely will let Matt finish out and we will get this recorded. So Matt, take your take your time. All right. Thank you, David. Let's get started. So really quick about me, Matt Jimison. MVP and business applications. Actually was fortunate enough to be awarded that in June of this year, so still brand new MVP. And have a background ex background in SharePoint, but let's uh, let's not worry about that right now. Let's go ahead and just jump into what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about custom connectors for Azure OpenAI. I wanted to point out first quickly there are existing options if you're not wanting to create one. The first one in April actually mentioned this earlier was the create text with GPT. That's going to be an option for you and it's going to give you the ability to create a prompt and it's got some additional crafting materials in there as you can see on the screen one thing you can't do is you aren't going to be able to really sort of fine tune some of the behind the scenes settings on azure openai that we'll see in a minute this is a great option though number two is openai independent connector this one is very similar to what we're going to be working on today the difference is this one actually connects to openai it doesn't connect to azure openai but this is another great example of a connector that you can actually utilize today if you want and last but not least, Microsoft has an awesome custom connector. It has a ton of capabilities. And for us, what we're doing is, is we're going to be creating more of a branding and a specific main chat completion action. And so that's the reason for that, why you might want to do this. It's going to give you a lot of control as far as what you expose your users to. Maybe you don't want them to have as many actions here as you're seeing. And also just good to sort of walk through the process and how that looks. All right. So let's just jump into it. I was going to unveiled giraffe geeks today which is my my counter to chris kent's warrior horses but we don't have a lot of time to talk about giraffes today so we will we'll just leave that there for now but what we're going to do is we're going to go hop over to the power automate studio and we're going to actually see that we don't see custom connectors because by default they're not going to be there you're going to need to jump over to more discover all and here you're going to actually be able to see them i'm gonna actually just pin it and then i'm just going to click on custom connectors so make custom connectors your friend in power automate going to click on new custom connector. We're just going to do a blank connector and we're just going to call this giraffe AI. And we can upload an image here if we want to. And so we have, let's see here. We'll just go ahead and we'll just use this one. And we will go ahead and leave that blank. Now we're going to jump over to Postman for a second here and we're going to be copying a lot of stuff. You are going to have when you create a resource in Azure OpenAI, you're going to have a host URL. And so what we're doing right here is we're grabbing that and we're going to set that as the host. And this base URL is going to be forward slash. So this is going to vary for you. The authentication that we want to use is API key. And so we can give it a parameter label of API key, but we want API dash key as our actual value here. Now, from a definition perspective, we want to create one definition. We're going to call this chat completion, and we have to give that an operation ID. We'll call it chat completion. And then what we want to do next is we want to say we want to import from sample on the request. It's going to be a post, and it is going to be this URL. And so we're going to copy this URL over here, and we're going to go to the URL. One thing that's going to change here, and the, really kind of one of the keys of the demo, there are a lot of different models in Azure OpenAI. And so what we're actually going to do is we're going to get rid of GPT-3.5 Turbo, and we're going to actually set this to the brackets model. This is going to give us the ability to change this. So that's going to make that dynamic. We'll go ahead and do content type application JSON. And then for the body, and again, this is why I've got Postman up here, I'm going to go ahead and just copy. This is an example body that I'm actually sending over to it. So we're going to go ahead and say that here, and then we're going to go ahead and click import. OK, so now that we've done that, we're going to make a few quick changes. If we go over here to model like I talked about, we can actually we could say yes, it's going to be required, but we can go down here and go to static and we can actually say GPT-35 Turbo, GPT-35 Turbo 16K, 
GPT-4 and GPT-4, the 32K. I highly recommend when you create your models in Azure OpenAI, the deployment name, give it the exact same name of the model because that makes it a lot easier to sort of predict. Now, if your users are using something different, they can override that with a custom value, but this is gonna give us a list of options to choose from, and these are sort of four of the standard ones. So we're gonna go ahead and say back on that. And then if we continue to go down here really quickly, for API version, we're going to go ahead and set the default value to 2023.05.15. There's a link in the resources that show you all of the different schema API versions that you can utilize. We're going to say it's required and it's internal, so we don't want people to use it. Actually, you know, we'll say it's advanced, so if they want to change it, they can. And then we need to go to content type. We're going to go ahead and set that to application JSON. We're going to say it's required. We're going to say it's internal. Nobody's going to ever need to change that. And then lastly, we're going to go over to the body, which is the most important part. It's absolutely going to have to be required. And then let's look really quickly at the different settings in the body. So we have a frequency penalty and we're going to set that default value to seven. It's required and we're going to say it's advanced. So this is where I'm giving you essentially the ability to change everything about the call if you want to and only if you want to. Max tokens here, we're going to go ahead again. We're going to say it's required, but it's 2000 by default and it's advanced. And we're going to, for content, this is the actual content that we're sending in. That's going to be required. And then it's just text. The role is interesting because there are three roles essentially that we can use here. It's going to be required. And we're going to say static. And we have three roles. We have the system. That's the system prompt. We have user. That's the user asking a question. And we have assistant, which is the assistant responding. So we're going to go ahead and put those options in there for that. And then quickly moving over to presence penalty, we're going to say again, zero is the default, it's required and it's advanced. So we don't want to necessarily put those types of values in front of the end user if we don't need to, because, and that's why we're sort of choosing advanced, right? Because those default values are typically going to work pretty well. For the stop sequence, we're not actually going to need that. We're just going to leave that here. It's not going to be required. Temperature, we're going to give it a default of zero. We're going to say it's required. We're going to say it is advanced. And then top P, we're going to do very similar. We're going to say a default value of one. It's required and it's advanced as well. OK, so now we've essentially created the request. Now let's go ahead and create the connector really quick. This could take just a few seconds. So we will go ahead and wait for all that to be created. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. So now what we need to do to test it is we need to create a new connection to it. And I'm going to go jump over to Azure OpenAI. And so I've got my key right here. I'm not going to show you guys, but I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to go back over here. And so we're just going to create this connection. And then now if I jump back here, I need to refresh this so that it's going to pick it up. So now we actually have a connection. Now we can say GPT-335 Turbo. This does not, this test UI doesn't show you the options the way we'll see it in Power Automate here in a second. But we're going to say that, and then we're going to say the role is user, and we can say the constant is how are you. So we're just essentially asking how the bot's doing. Okay, we got a response back. I don't have feelings as an AI, but I'm here to help you with any questions. So now we know it works, which is awesome. And now we can just say update connector, and then we're pretty much done at this point. There's an additional step I'm not gonna show you for time purposes, but if your company's using multiple Azure OpenAI resources, which is fairly common, especially with the limitations right now, you can create an additional connection parameter that would allow someone to override that URL. So each resource is going to have potentially that host URL, and then it's going to have that API key. So I'm going to post a blog post on that. So if you're interested, by all means, check that out here in the future. OK, so now lastly, really quick, just to sort of see how does this all work, we're going to go to my flows. We're going to create a new flow. We're going to do an automated cloud flow. We're going to do we're going to call this tweets and we're going to say when an item is created in SharePoint. So I have over here in Giraffe Geeks, I have this tweet queue. And so this queue is basically where the giraffes are putting in potential tweets to use. And then we're going to analyze them and see if they're positive, negative or neutral. So I'm going to go ahead and select that site. I'm going to go ahead and select the tweet queue. So now I'm looking for just when new things are created there. Then I'm going to go over here to custom. And then this is where we're going to choose Giraffe AI and we have our chat completion. And so we're going to go ahead and select that. The model, this is where we get that nice drop down. So we've got GPT-35 Turbo. And for the role, we're going to say this is the user. And then we're going to say, we're going to just actually 
put in here the title, the title coming from the item, and we're going to just put a line, sort of a line break here, and we're going to say classify the above text as positive, negative, or neutral. We're going to say only respond with one of these three values. Okay, and then everything else again, we're not going to really need to change any of this. The next thing that we're going to do is we're actually going to do update item. And so once we get that value, we're going to want to actually change a field that's in the SharePoint list. And so we're going to go back here. We're going to go to draft geeks. We're going to go and pick the tweet queue. And then the ID is going to be the ID of this thing that came in. OK, we'll go ahead and save it and then we will test it and we will add a tweet in here really quickly. OK, so I'm going to manually test it. It's going to wait for me and we're going to go ahead and here and we're going to say. Let us know what you think about our new movie. We think it stinks. And we'll go ahead and click save. OK, and so now we should see this pick up here. In a moment. OK, and there it did. So we can see that we went put in here. Let us know what you think about our new movie, right? There's then the rest of our response. And you can see that ChatGPT gave us back the response just negative, which is what I was hoping it would do. And then we updated that item. And so now if we refresh this, we'll actually see that the classification. With I updated the wrong. I didn't actually update the value that would that would help. So what we should have done here is we should have gone in here and said the classification value and then put that in there as the op. So what we would do here is we would say custom value and then what we want to do is look at the actual completion here and we want to actually pick. Yes, the content. OK, we'll go ahead and skip that for now since I think we're at time. We're a minute over, but that is the demo. So thanks, everyone. Matt, very, very cool stuff. Really, uh, really appreciate the creativity there. Did have one uh, one audio question. <laughs> Uh, that was Warrior Horse for when and where. So I look forward to the epic battle between the giraffes and the warrior horses. Should be very fun. Thank you. All right. Well, a uh, huge appreciation to all of our presenters today. Jeff and Dennis and Matt, fantastic job. Uh, really love seeing the variety of ways in which the community is putting together uh, use of this technology. So thank you all. Keep bringing it to us. Let's get this call wrapped up. Uh, there is some opportunity for us all to get more involved. We have our Discord channel, so this is where those new cool kids are at. Uh, we've got over 700 now, so it's open to everyone. It's a great opportunity to stay involved in all the areas of the community because it's kind of a one-stop shop. We've got a number of channels that you can get involved with there. Check it out, aka.ms slash community slash Discord. And then, of course, we want to find out if everything is working for you on these calls, so please do let us know. This allows us to let our management know that these calls are valuable for you and the the rest of the community even if you already submitted they like to see consistent satisfaction so feel free to throw something in there uh, let us know what you are working what's working for you maybe some other areas you'd like to see improvement on we are looking to ensure that this is the best use of your time all right well the recording will be available in 24 hours on the microsoft 365 and power platform community youtube channel uh, if you see the video is ready inside the teams it is a pretty little liar unless you're a microsoft employee so just go over to ak.ms slash community slash videos. Make sure you subscribe to all of our YouTube accounts and you will be alerted as soon as the video drops. You'll get an email, you'll get a little sub subscription pop up and it'll be fantastic. It'll be well worth it. You can also follow us on X or the artist formerly known as Twitter for updates at M365PNP. We've got our LinkedIn that you can share and get involved with as well. Our next call, when, where, how, November 9th, a week, two weeks from today, uh, but a week from today is our Viva Connections and SharePoint Framework call on November 2nd. We are here every Thursday for you, no matter what. You can get the invites to all these calls at ak.ms slash community slash calls. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the week and a wonderful weekend. We appreciate all that you're doing for this community. Keep it up. Aww.